This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2021. Lesson 2 from the series Present Truth in Deuteronomy, ready for teaching on October 9, titled Moses' History Lesson, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 2. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus came and died and provided salvation for us, but there in the book of Deuteronomy we find the words of Moses, we also find a recording of what it would be like when Jesus came and what the result might be. As we continue this study, we pray that you'll be here to bless us and guide us, whether we're listening in Cairo or in Berlin or in Pittsburgh, California or in Vienna or in Mauritius or Mount Hagen or Puerto Rico or Toronto or Hong Kong. Wherever we are, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be there to guide and bless us as we open your word this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory verse today is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. And they all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Let's read that again. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4. And they all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The book of Deuteronomy begins with the first verse of chapter 1. These are the words which Moses spoke. Thus begins the book of Deuteronomy, and though, yes, Moses and the presence of Moses dominate the book, from these opening words to his death in the land of Moab, as recorded in Deuteronomy 34 verse 5, so Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord, Deuteronomy, as the whole Bible, is really about the Lord Jesus. For he is the one who created us, as we read in the Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 and those famous verses in John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God and all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And he sustains us, as we read in Colossians 1, 15 to 17, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all all things consist. And this is also expressed in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And he redeems us, as we read in Isaiah 41 verse 14, Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And Titus 2 verse 14, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And, in a looser sense of these words, Deuteronomy reveals how the Lord continued to create, sustain and redeem his people at this crucial time in salvation history. Basically, just as the children of Israel are finally to enter Canaan, Moses gives them a history lesson, a theme that is repeated all through the Bible. Remember what the Lord has done for you in the past. This admonition should mean something to us, we who are on the borders of a better 
promised land. As we read in Life Sketches, page 196, something lovely written by Ellen G. White. In reviewing our past history, having travelled over every step of advance to our present standing, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Sunday, October 3, The Ministry of Moses All through the Bible, the presence of Moses is felt, and though he's not mentioned until Exodus chapter 2 and verse 2, he had written the book of Genesis, God's authoritative and foundational story of who we are, how we got here, why things are as bad as they are, and yet, why we can hope anyway. Creation? The fall, the promise of redemption, the flood, Abraham, the gospel, all have their roots in Genesis, and its author was the prophet Moses. It's hard to gauge adequately the influence that this one man, hardly flawless, was nevertheless able to exert for God, because he loved the Lord and wanted to serve him. Read Exodus 32, verses 29 to 32, which records the conversation between the Lord and Moses after the terrible sin of the golden calf. What insight does this story give us about the character of Moses and why, despite whatever flaws he had, the Lord was able to use him in such a mighty way? Exodus 32, beginning at verse 29. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Even though Moses had nothing to do with the sin, he sought to intercede for this sinful people, even being willing to lose his own soul on their behalf. Fascinatingly enough, in Exodus 32, verse 32, when Moses asked God to forgive their sin, the verb actually means to bear. Thus, Moses, understanding the gravity of sin and what it took to atone for it, asked God indeed to bear their sin. And that is because this is the only way, ultimately, that their sin, any sin, could be forgiven. Thus, here we have, early in the Bible, a powerful expression of substitution in which God himself, in the person of Jesus, will bear in himself the full brunt and penalty of our sin. God's preordained way of salvation for humanity while remaining true to the principles of his government and law. Indeed, Many centuries later, Peter would write about Jesus in 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Meanwhile, what we see in this story of Moses and his reaction to their sin is Moses in the role of intercessor on behalf of a fallen, sinful people, a precursor to what Jesus also will do for us, as we read in Hebrews 7, verse 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So, to finish the day, willing to lose your own soul for his people? Think more about the implications of those words. What can we learn from them for ourselves about what it means truly to love others?
Monday, October 4. Fulfilled Prophecy Despite some of the error that modern science tries to promulgate as truth, such as that our universe by itself arose from absolutely nothing, or that all life on Earth arose by chance from simple chemicals, science has nonetheless given us some astonishing insights into God's creative power. The harmony, the balance, the precision of many aspects of the natural world, even in its fallen state, continue to astound those who study them. And, if God can be so precise with physical things, he certainly will be precise with spiritual things as well. Hence, in the opening verses of Deuteronomy, we can see more of God's incredible precision. Read Deuteronomy 1, 1-6. What is the prophetic significance of the fact that Deuteronomy 1, 3 talks about the 40th year? Deuteronomy 1, beginning at verse 1. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness in the plain opposite Zaph, between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth and Dizahab. It is eleven days' journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Now it came to pass in the fortieth year, in the eleventh month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him as commandments to them, after he had killed Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who dwelt at Ashtaroth in Edrai. On this side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain the law, saying, The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, We have dwelt long upon this mountain. After the fiasco, when Moses sent spies from Kadesh Barnea to check out the land, and the people rejected the call to take the land, what happened? They were told that they would not enter into the promised land as they had hoped. And for how long would they wait before entering? Numbers 14.34 reads, According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection. Hence, Deuteronomy takes up the story of God's people in the 40th year, exactly as God had told them. In other words, God's prophetic word is as trustworthy as God himself, and what we see here in the opening verses of Deuteronomy is more evidence of that trustworthiness. That is, God will do what he says, and will do it when he says that he will do it. Of course, This isn't the only prophetic time period that was fulfilled as God had said. Looking back from our vantage point today, we can find in Daniel 9, 24-27, for instance, the time period for Jesus fulfilled just as the Lord had said, as we read in Daniel chapter 9, beginning at verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. We can see that the time and times and half a time of Daniel 7.25 has been fulfilled in history as well as in the 2,300 days of Daniel 8.14. And we're going to look at Daniel 7.25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, 
and times and half a time. And Revelation 12, verses 6 to 14, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And Revelation 13, 5, And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for forty-two months. And we'll finish this piece with Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And besides the precise time elements, the prophecies of Daniel 7 and 2 and 8, which so precisely and accurately predicted world history, have given us overwhelming evidence of God's foreknowledge, control and trustworthiness. And so to finish today, we can see that the Lord faithfully fulfilled these past prophecies just as predicted. Why should this give us confidence that we can trust him on the things he said would come that are yet in the future? Tuesday, October 5, a thousand times more numerous. After the long trek in the wilderness, Moses, speaking for the Lord, he was a prophet, though indeed more than a prophet, said in Deuteronomy 1 verse 8, See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to give to them and their descendants after them. Notice, however, what comes next. Read Deuteronomy 1, 9 to 11. What is the significance of these words, especially in light of the fact that, in a real sense, they were being punished by God for the rebellion of Kadesh Barnea? Deuteronomy 1, beginning at verse 9. And I spoke to you at that time, saying, I alone am not able to bear you. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. May the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are, and bless you as he has promised you. Here we see another example of the graciousness of God. Even amid the wilderness wanderings, they were blessed, as we read in Nehemiah 9.21. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing, their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. And Moses, again showing his love for his people, asked God to multiply them a thousand more times than God already had done. Read Deuteronomy 1, 12 to 17. As a direct result of God's blessing upon the people, what happened and what steps did Moses take to deal with the situation? Deuteronomy 1, beginning at verse 12. 
How can I alone bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints? Choose wise, understanding and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And you answered me and said, The thing which you have told us to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officers for your tribes. Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the stranger who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, bring to me, and I will hear it. Thus, even when the Lord was so powerfully present among them, there was the need for organization, for structure, for a system of accountability. Israel was a kahal, Q-A-H-A-L, an organized assembly, as we read in Deuteronomy 31 and verse 30. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. A precursor to the New Testament ecclesia, or Greek for church, as we read in Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And though working in different context, Paul was never far from his Jewish roots, and in 1 Corinthians 12 we see him clearly delineating the need for qualified people to assume various roles for the proper functioning of the body, just as we see here in Deuteronomy and the Kahal in the wilderness. The church today, as the Kahal back then, needs to be a unified body with people fulfilling various roles according to their gifts. Though we sometimes hear people rail against organised religion, what would they prefer? Disorganised religion instead? The Word of God, especially the New Testament, acknowledges no other kind but an organised one. Wednesday, October 6, Kadesh Barnea. A spectre has been haunting the early parts of the book of Deuteronomy, the spectre of Kadesh Barnea. This unfortunate story, as we have seen, set the immediate background for the book of Deuteronomy, and it's worth taking a closer look at it. Read Numbers 14, how did the people react to the report of the spies, and what were the results of their reaction? We'll also look at Deuteronomy 1, 20-46. Numbers chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not 
fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. And Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it, for by your might you brought these people out from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your frame will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. And now, I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Then... The Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now these ten times, and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel made against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness, all of you who were numbered according to your entire number, from twenty years old and above. Except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and shall know my re rejection." I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Now, the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report on the land, those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. Then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are! And we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, 
lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. But they presume to go up to the mountain top. Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. And in Deuteronomy 1, beginning at verse 20, And I said to you, You have come to the mountains of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. And every one of you came near to me and said, Let us send men before us, and let them search out the land for us, and bring back word to us of the way by which we should go up, and of the cities into which we shall come. The plan pleased me well, so I took twelve of your men, one man from each tribe, and they departed and went up into the mountains, and came to the valley of Eshcol, and spied it out. They also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. And they brought back word to us, saying, It is a good land into which the Lord our God is giving us. Nevertheless, you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you complained in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people are greater and taller than we, the cities are great and fortified to the heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Then I said to you, Do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all that you did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents to show you the way you should go in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. And the Lord heard the sound of your words, and was angry, and took an oath, saying, Surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see that good land of which I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him and his children I am giving the land on which he walked, because he wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord was also angry with me for your sake, saying, Even you shall not go in there. Joshua the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones and your children, who you say will be victims, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. To them I will give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Then you answered and said to me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight, just as the Lord our God commanded us. And when every one of you had girded on his weapons of war, you were ready to go up into the mountain. And the Lord said to me, Tell them, do not go up nor fight, for I am not among you, lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, yet you would not listen, but rebelled against the command of the Lord and presumptuously went up into the mountain. And the Amorites who dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do and drove you back from Seir to Hormah. Then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice nor give ear to you. So you remained in Kadesh many days according to the days that you spent there. We can drive many important lessons from this story, but one important lesson which will appear again in the book can be found in Numbers 14 as well. Let's reread Numbers 14, 11 to 20. Though we see Moses again in the role of intercessor, what is significant about his line of reasoning with the Lord regarding why the Lord should not destroy them? 
Numbers 14, beginning at verse 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. And Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it. For by your might you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring his people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. And now, I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation." Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Think about what Moses was saying to God. If you do this, look at how you will appear in the eyes of the Egyptians and the other nations in the area. This point is important because ultimately everything that God had wanted to do with Israel wasn't just for the sake of Israel. It also was for humanity as a whole. The nation of Israel was to be a light to the world, a witness to the ancients about the love and power and salvation found in the true God and not in the worthless idols that these people had worshipped. However, as Moses said, if you wipe this people out, then what? The nations will say, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. In other words, what we see here is a theme found all through the Bible. The idea that God is to be glorified in his people, that the glory and goodness and love and power of God are to be revealed in his church, through what he does, through his people. Of course, his people don't always make it easy for him to do this. But ultimately, God will be glorified through his people's actions on earth. And so, to finish today, read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. What is Paul saying here, and how does this happen? How is the manifold wisdom of God made manifest to the cosmos? What role, if any, do we have as individuals in bringing this about? Ephesians 3.10 To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Thursday, October 7, The Iniquity of the Amorite In Deuteronomy chapter 2 and chapter 3, Moses continues to recount Israelite history and how, with God's blessing, they routed their enemies. When they were faithful, God gave them the victory over even giants. As we read in Deuteronomy 2, 11, they were also regarded as giants, like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Emim. And in verse 20 of chapter 2, that was also regarded as a land of giants. Giants formerly dwelt there, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim. And Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 13, The rest of Gilead and all Bashan, the kingdom of Og, I gave to half the tribe of Manasseh. All the region of Argob with all Bashan was called the land of the giants. Of course, this brings up the difficult topic, which we must at least touch on regarding the destruction of these people. Though the children of Israel would often speak 
peace first to a nation, yet if the people didn't accept that offer, sometimes the Israelites would go in and destroy them, including women and children. Deuteronomy 20 verses 10 and 11. When you go near a city to fight against it, then proclaim an offer of peace to it. And it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace and open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you. And we read in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 33 and 34, And the Lord our God delivered him over to us, so we defeated him, his sons, and all his people. We took all his cities at that time, and we utterly destroyed the men, women, and the little ones of every city. We left none remaining. Some try to get around this simply by saying that these stories are not true. However, because we believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, as we read in 2 Timothy 3.16, that's not a viable option for Seventh-day Adventists. Thus, we are left with a difficult question regarding these incidents. Read Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 to 16. What did God say to Abram in Genesis 15, verse 16? And how does it shed some light on this difficult topic? Genesis 15, beginning at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down to the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and you will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions." Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. There's no question that many of these pagan nations were exceedingly brutal and cruel people who justifiably could have faced the wrath and punishment of God long before then. That's true, and even if God waited patiently for them to change their ways, and they didn't change, this still didn't alter the hard reality about killing of everyone, including children. Of course, probably many more children were killed in the flood than were killed by the Israelites. The fact is that, for now, given the limited information we have about the full context of the events, we just need to accept this hard reality and trust in the goodness of God, which has been revealed in so many other ways. Faith isn't just about loving God on a beautiful day in a pretty forest full of wonderful sights and sounds. It's also about trusting in Him despite what we don't fully understand.
And so to finish the day, read 1 Corinthians 10, 1-4 and John 14, verse 9. How do these verses and many others like them help us learn to trust in the love, justice and goodness of God even when we see things that seem hard to square with this understanding of God? 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And John 14, verse 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Friday, October 8. Here's how one scholar seeks to answer the hard questions about what the Israelites did to some of these nations. And it's by Daniel I. Block in the NIV application commentary, Deuteronomy, pages 40, sorry, pages 98 and 99, published in 2012. As creator of all things and all human beings and as sovereign over all, God can do anything he wants with anyone and be right in doing so. The ways of God are a mystery. Since we will never completely understand him, we might as well relax with the questions in our minds. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 offers some consolation. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. According to the biblical picture of the Canaanites, these peoples were extremely wicked and their annihilation represented God's judgment for their sin. The destruction of the Canaanites was neither the first nor the last time God would do this. The differences between the Canaanites' fate and the fate of humanity, except for Noah's family as described in Genesis 6-9, involve scale and agency. God never intended for the Israelites to make the policy of Harem, the total destruction, as a general policy towards outsiders, as you read in Deuteronomy 7.1. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you, expressly identifies and thereby delimits the target peoples. The Israelites were not to follow these policies against the Aramaeans or Edomites or Egyptians or anyone else, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 10 to 18. When you go near a city to fight against it, then proclaim an offering of peace to it. And it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace and open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and shall serve you. Now, if the city will not make peace with you, but war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, you shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. But the women, the little ones, the livestock, and all that is in the city, all its spoil, you shall plunder for yourself. And you shall eat the enemy's plunder which the Lord your God gives you. Thus you shall go to all the cities which are very far from you, which are not of the cities of these nations, but of the cities of these peoples, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive. But you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations, which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. 
The Canaanites suffered a fate that ultimately all sinners will face, the judgment of God. God's elimination of the Canaanites was a necessary step in the history of salvation. Although the Canaanites as a whole were targets of God's judgment, they had at least 40 years of advance warning. See Rahab's confession in Joshua 2, verses 8 to 11. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven, above and on earth beneath. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, think about our understanding of the millennium in which we will have a thousand years to hear all our questions answered. How can this understanding help us to learn to trust in God despite whatever hard questions we have now? Two, what are some of the ways that God led you in the past that can help you learn to trust him in the future? Why is it important not to forget how God has worked in our lives? 3. In class, go over the question at the end of Sunday study about Moses' willingness to lose his own soul for the sake of his people. Is that a right attitude to have? What, if anything, is worth losing one's soul over, especially considering what it cost to redeem it? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled My Mother's Heritage. It's by Park Yoon Sook. My mother turned to me as she was dying from gallbladder cancer. You must go to church, she said. Mother had taken me to church every Sabbath since I was a young girl, but I had stopped attending as I got busy with my shop in Hanam, a suburb of South Korea's capital, Seoul. Mother's words troubled me as I struggled both to work and raise my son, daughter and three nephews. I realised that I could not succeed on my own and I returned to Jesus. As my love for Jesus grew, he gave me a heart to care for needy neighbours. A relative introduced me to Hong Soon Mi. A year after we met, Soon Mi's husband was diagnosed with bone marrow cancer. When I learnt that he couldn't afford surgery, I set up a donation box on the street outside my shop. Many people ridiculed me, saying, Why are you raising money for someone who isn't a relative? But I kept the donation box in place. On Soon Mi's birthday, I presented her with a 45-pound, 20-kilogram bag of rice. Take this gift from my shop, I said. She later told me that her whole family cried when they saw the gift. Soon Me didn't come to church right away, but she read the Adventist magazines that I gave her and learned that Seventh-day Adventists love Jesus and people. I put Soon Me in charge of my shop and provided her with a salary and daily necessities, such as fruit and rice, for about two years. After that, I made her the manager of a small restaurant that I ran. A year after beginning to manage the restaurant, she asked, why don't you invite me to church? Why, I said, you know that you are welcome. Then I'll go, she said. After six years of friendship, soon me visited West Hanam Seventh-day Adventist Church for the first time. Three years later, she became a deaconess and later her husband and son were baptised. When I first opened my shop, I was the only Adventist in the neighbourhood. Now, seven merchants are Adventist. The church has a good reputation in the area. 
I thank my mother for giving me a heritage of faith, and I give all glory to God for using Adventist merchants like me for good. And there's a photograph of her here. This mission story illustrates mission objective number one of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to revive the concept of worldwide mission and sacrifice for mission as a way of life involving not only pastors, but every church member. Learn more at IWillGo2020.org. This quarter, your 13th Sabbath offering will support two mission projects in South Korea. Read more about Soon Me last week. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.